There are so many moments in the story and the lore where a character experiences a prophetic dream or vision, so Theon's moment gets pushed to the side and easily overlooked or forgotten about. I don't think I've had a single conversation with anyone about this particular chapter I'm about to slice, dice, dissect, and go over. Not a single direct message about one of your thoughts on it. Well, because it's Theon. I've taken your castle. Theon? It's Prince Theon now. Get up. You have to get dressed. I've taken Winterfell. I took it. I am occupying it. I sent men over the walls with grappling claws and ropes. Why? I can't blame y'all for not caring about this possible prophecy when we have Quaithe, Melisandre, Daenerys, Bran, the Ghost of High Heart, Patches, and who knows how many more trying to decipher their own visions of possible events or symbolism of events yet to happen. In the second book, where Theon does actually hold the spotlight from time to time with six POV chapters under his belt, we get a deep understanding of the character and all his motives for all his actions. Something we don't even get for Rob, who in the entire series never got a POV chapter. No exaggeration here, for years I've been passively planning a video discussing the Three-Eyed Raven's influence on this fictional world and all the characters that have been under his strings but clearly it hasn't resulted in much to show. But I'm convinced the current Greyjoys are part of the Three-Eyed Raven's surveillance and possibly manipulation. In the 56th chapter of A Clash of Kings, Theon is calling himself the Prince of Winterfell after taking the unguarded castle with a handful of his father's ironborn men. While laying in Ned's, his foster father's bed, Theon sleeps restlessly, filled with fear, paranoia, and regret of his deceitful actions. His nightmares progressively get darker and stranger until this one is experienced. That night, he dreamed of the feast Ned Stark had thrown when King Robert came to Winterfell. The hall rang with music and laughter, though the cold winds were rising outside. At first, it was all wine and roast meat, and Theon was making japes, and eyeing the serving girls and having himself a fine time, until he noticed that the room was growing darker. The music did not seem so jolly then. He heard discords and strange silences and notes that hung in the air bleeding. Suddenly the wine turned bitter in his mouth, and when he looked up from his cup, he saw that he was dining with the dead. King Robert sat with his guts spilling out on the table from the great gash in his belly, and Lord Eddard was headless beside him. Corpses lined the benches below, grey-brown flesh slothing off their bones as they raised their cups to toast, worms crawling in and out of the holes that were their eyes. He knew them, every one. Jory Cassell and Fat Tom, Porther and Cain, and Hullen the Master of Horse, and all the others who had ridden south of King's Landing never to return. Micken and Chael sat together, one dripping blood and the other water. Benfred Tallhart and his wild hairs filled most of a table. The miller's wife was there as well, and Farlin, even the wildling Theon had killed, in the wolf's wood the day he had saved Bran's life. But there were others with faces he had never known in life. Faces he had seen only in stone. The slim, sad girl who wore a crown of pale blue roses and a white gown spattered with gore could only be Lyanna. Her brother Brandon stood beside her and their father Lord Rickard just behind. Along the walls, figures half seen moved through the shadows, pale shades with longer faces. The sight of them sent fear shivering through Theon, sharp as a knife. And then the tall doors opened with a crash, and a freezing gale blew down the hall and Rob came walking out of the night. Greywind stalked beside, eyes burning, and man and wolf alike bled from half a hundred savage wounds. Theon woke with a scream, startling Wex so badly that the boy ran naked from the room. When his guards burst in with drawn swords, he ordered them to bring him the maester. By the time Lewin arrived, rumpled and sleepy, a cup of wine had steadied Theon's hands, and he was feeling ashamed of his panic. A dream, he muttered. That was all it was. It meant nothing. Nothing, Lewin agreed solemnly. He had left a sleeping draft, but Theon poured it down the privy shaft the moment he was gone. Lewin was a man as well as a maester, and a man had no love for him. He wants me to sleep, yes, to sleep and never wake. He'd like that as much as Asha would. Super long quote there, I know, but all interesting. Theon was very well aware by this point of the story, the details behind Robert and Ned's deaths, along with all his northmen that went down south, King's Landing with him. Nothing special about seeing Robert's guts spilling out in good old headless Ned in a dream. But the very detailed part about Lyanna and the other grim long faces instantly raises eyebrows. 
Then things take a magical turn after mention of Rob and Greywind's half hundred savage runes. No way he could have known the manner of their deaths, cause it didn't happen yet. The Red Wedding goes down late into the third book, and dreams are the most common way of looking into the future in this magic filled world. Even if it wasn't Theon's own doing, the Three-Eyed Raven is capable of invading dreams and inserting visions to serve his purpose. But for what reason? Why is seeing the people who were like family to him dead significant? It does highlight his inner struggle, yes, but also foreshadows his redemption arc. Theon would probably never have it in him to actually kill Bran and Rickon if he caught them, but murdering children he was familiar with was perfectly acceptable if it got him his father's and the rest of the Ironborn's acceptance. He did some horrible things to feel a sense of belonging where he never felt in Winterfell or in the presence of any Ironborn. Seeing dead Starks and Northmen in his dream wasn't meant to torment him, but to set him on track for the redemption arc where something big is in store. Theon clearly has a role to play in either the Game of Thrones or War for Dawn, especially with so much focus on this character, similar to Jaime Lannister, who has only gotten more and more POV chapters as the story progressed. Rob and Grey Wind was the final shock needed to wake him up. Rob was the closest to Theon growing up in Winterfell. They were around the same age, and Jon Snow was never worth this jerk-off's attention because of his bastard parentage. A bunch of crossbow bolts to the body was how both Rob and Grey Wind went out, matching Theon's dream. During the war, Theon served his foster brother well in the battlefield and in council, but just being in the presence of his real father broke him. Theon justified his actions by characterizing Ned Stark as cold towards him, but that's the way Ned was to almost everyone. A hard life filled with terrible duty made him this way. But Theon was always treated well under his roof, and not like the hostage that he was supposed to be. The vision of Rob and Greywind in this condition would be burned into Theon's memory forever, and would help reignite his loyalty. The part about Lyanna is a little stranger though. The manner in which a character died is present for most of the characters in Theon's dream, so seeing Lyanna covered in blood is not particularly unique. But why the crown of pale blue roses, the white gown? Living in Winterfell, Theon must have heard the stories about how Ned's beloved younger sister died at the end of Robert's Rebellion, but no one was told how. Ned would have never hinted at a bloody dress when he found her, because it would lead to more unwanted questions. The crown of blue roses is kind of synonymous with Lyanna's character, since she's known for enjoying their smell in her youth, and Rhaegar did hand her a crown of these flowers while naming her his queen of love and beauty. This part should be common knowledge to everyone in the north, but the blood-covered white dress is still a mystery. This wasn't an ordinary dream, they rarely are in the books. This was a magical vision, past events mixed with events yet to come. The pale shades, the long grim faces he saw were clearly some of the long dead Stark lords and kings. Long grim faces, like Ned, Benjen, and Arya's, is a common distinct family trait they all share. Theon says he's only ever seen them in stone because having stone statues carved in the likeness of a dead Stark over their tomb was a family tradition. At one point, Theon must have went down to the crypts of Winterfell and witnessed it firsthand. The reason for the sight of them scaring him to the point of feeling shivers as sharp as a knife is the guilt he feels for what he did to the family that sheltered him under Winterfell. But it's also notable who didn't appear in this dream that were present in the Winterfell feast early into the first book. John was there. The chapter where we see the feast go down is in his point of view. The Stark sisters, Arya and Sansa are both there, and even Benjen, who happened to enter the feast hall with Theon by his side. Their current status should be unknown to Theon, aside from Sansa of course, who was forcibly being held in King's Landing. Having visions of Bran and Rickon would only hinder the purpose of the dream. The Thread Raven wouldn't give him clues to their whereabouts after just escaping their captor. If Theon is to be a future ally, he needs to get back on the redemption arc ASAP. Visions of a dead Rob was the best way to serve this purpose. After Ramsay turns Theon into a shell of the asshole he once was, there's no real hope of him ever leading the Ironborn, but there are better uses for this character, like helping down the bolted hold over the north as restitution. If you have different thoughts on this prophetic dream, let's hear them. And if you're down to wait around for a fully fleshed out 3 at Raven video, you can subscribe for that, coming in approximately 7 years. That would be a nice way to put a close to the channel. Thanks for watching guys.